Good day, students. So welcome to part one of the Geometry Regions uh, review uh, for January 2014. In this installment, we are going to be going over problems one through five. All right, the collection of um, clips can be found on math.serve.com slash test prep. You can also gain um, access to the PDF document of the test that I'm working on. All right, so let's take a look at uh, problem number one. So problem one says the midpoint of uh, segment AB um, is M, which has a coordinate 4, 2. If the coordinates of A are 6 and negative 4, what are the coordinates of B? Okay, so first thing I'm going to do here is write down the formula that basically helps connect out the three coordinates that we're dealing with here. Set up an equation and solve for the coordinates of B. Okay. So let's say we have um, two points, points A and B, point A, given by x1, y1, and point B, given by x2, y2. Then the midpoint, um, M, the, point, the midpoint, um, uh, let's just write it out, midpoint, of the segment AB is given by the equation x1 plus x2 divided by 2. The average of the x's for the two points gives you the x coordinate of the midpoint. Okay? The same goes for the y. So y1 plus y2 over 2, that gives you the y coordinate of your midpoint. So that's this is basically how. Um, you calculate the midpoint, okay? So let me just give you a visual. Let's say you have a segment like this. Um, so let's say this is segment AB, okay? So um, this is A, B, and the coordinates of point A is X1, Y1, and then the coordinates of point B is X2, Y2. Then the midpoint, right here can be determined by using that formula that we just used so that's going to be x1 plus x2 over 2 and then y1 plus y2 over 2 all right so that's how you find the midpoint the midpoint is like the central um, point um, of the segment with the two points as the endpoints all right okay so what we're going to do is we're going to set up an, an equation by applying this um, scenario this formula is to this problem that we're dealing with right here okay so for point a we know that uh, point a is basically um, x1 y1 so x1 y1 is going to be 6 comma negative 4 so we can see that 6 is going to be x1 and then negative 4 is going to be y1 okay so let's write that down x1 is equal to 6 and then y1 is equal to negative 4. Now for and then for point B, um, point B as x2, y2, x2, y2. This one we do not know what they are, okay? x2 is question mark and y2 is question mark also. This is what we are asked to find. We are asked to find the coordinates of the second point, point B. Okay, um, and then the midpoint. We know that the midpoint, the midpoint of segment AB is equal to four, comma two. All right. In this problem, we call the midpoint M. So the midpoint is uh, four, comma two. All right, so let's go ahead and set up an equation. The formula we just wrote down here, the midpoint formula is what we're going to use to connect the two coordinates and the midpoint, okay? So um, the midpoint is equal to this. So midpoint is the point comma four, two, that's M, is equal to, um, let's see, X1 plus X2 over two, X1 is six, 6 plus what is x2 we do not know okay x2 over 2 comma and then for the y coordinate of our midpoint is y1 plus y2 over 2 y1 is negative 4 
y2 is, we do not know, y2 is just y2 over 2. Okay, so what do we have now? We have an equation. How do we solve this equation? Well, we just set corresponding coordinates to each other. So for the x's, to find x, to find the first missing piece, which is x2, what we're going to do is basically set the x coordinates equal to each other. Okay, so 4 uh, is equal to 6 plus x2 over 2. And we just solved this for x2. Now, how do we go about doing that? Well, it's a two step algebraic process. We get rid of this 2 first, the denominator, and then the 6. Okay, so multiply both sides by 2. And then that yields 8 is equal to 6 plus x2. And then to finish it up, you subtract 6 from both sides. And then you get um, x2 is equal to uh, 2. So that, that goes x2. Okay. Now let's go ahead and uh, find the other one, the other coordinate. What other coordinate do we need to find? We need to find y2. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. So uh, we want to find y2. Similar process to looking for x2. So to find y2, we're going to equate the y coordinates in this equation that we got by using the by applying the midpoint formula to our situation. Okay, so y2 is going to be the y coordinate of the midpoint, which is 2, equal to this y coordinate as, as a result of the formula, negative 4 plus y2 um, over 2. Same process as uh, we did over here, isolate y2. First of all, multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this denominator right here. So these two twos divide out. And then you will have uh, 4 equals negative 4 plus y2. And then to isolate y2, you simply add 4 to both sides. And then you have y2 is equal to 8. Okay? So point B is simply going to be 2 comma 8. There goes y2. I mean, that's go. That's b. And then we can clearly see that our answer is option number two. All right, let's move on to question number two. Number two is testing our ability to uh, construct us an angle. It says which diagram shows the construction of a 45 degree angle? So the question is, how do you construct a 45 degree angle? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to start with a straight line. Okay, I'm just going to be, I don't have a compass here, so I'm just going to be sketching the constructions. This is not going to be perfect at all. Okay, so you, you start with a straight line and just pick a point on the line. Now, how many degrees is there on a straight line? The straight line is 180 degrees. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to start with a 180 degrees and you want to bisect it. Uh, First, okay. So if I take 180 degrees and I bisect it, um, what I'll do to to do that construction, um, you just make an arc, okay. And then you place your compass here, make an arc somewhere there. Place your compass here, make another arc. And what you have is a perpendicular line bisecting this 180 degree angle. So what do you have when you bisect 180 degrees? You have a right triangle, okay? So um, what we have right now is two congruent angles that measure 90 degrees. So this one right here is 90 degrees, and this here is 90 degrees also. Target angle is 45. So what are we gonna do with our 90 degree angle? What we're gonna do is we're gonna repeat the same construction proce uh, procedure on the 90 degrees, basically by section of an angle, and that will give us 45 degrees, okay? So to accomplish that, we just um, make another arc here again, and then we're gonna use these two points to bisect this angle, okay? So you make an arc here, and then make another arc here from the other point, and then you have a segment, a line going through this, two points. Now what this line does is it bisects this 90 degree angle into 45 degrees. So what you have here, this angle right here will be 45. And then this other angle right here will be 45 degrees. So you just basically bisect 180 to get 290s and then you bisect one of the 90s to get 45 degrees. So let's take a look at this constructions right here, which one is consistent with this 
uh, construction uh, procedure, we can clearly see that our answer is option three. Because in option three, you start with a straight line, bisected it to get 90 degrees, and 90 degrees here, and then we went on to bisect one of these 90 degrees to get two congruent angles measuring 45 degrees each. So our answer is option number three. All right, for number three, it says, what are the coordinates of the center and the length of the radius of a circle whose equation is x plus one square plus y minus five square equals 16? So in order to do this, um, you need to know the um, standard form of the equation of a circle, okay? So the standard form of the equation of a circle is given by x minus um, h square plus y minus k square equals r square, okay? The center is hk. And the radius is given by uh, the square root of r square, which is r, okay? Now, what you want to note is that this minus here basically tell you that you need to take the opposite of the number next to each of these uh, variables in order to determine what h and k are. So you have minus k, h, you do the opposite of that, you get h, and the opposite of this, you get k. And then the square root of the number, the constant here, right, will give you the radius, okay? Now let's um, apply this formula to this situation here. We have x plus one square plus y minus five square equals 16, okay? So in this problem, h is going to be the opposite of this number right here, which is negative one. And then k is going to be the opposite of this number right here, which is five. All right, so do not forget to take the opposite. You don't just extract these numbers as they are, you take the opposite. So this basically tells us that the center is going to be HK. HK is what? Negative one, five. So let's see, we can eliminate options one and three. Now what's the radius? R. Now you have to be really careful. Some, some people might make a mistake and say, oh, the number to the right of the equal sign of the equation is your radius. The answer is, that's incorrect, okay? The radius is the square root of that value, whatever that number is, okay? So assuming you said um, the radius is 16, you pick option two, which is wrong. So the square root of 16 is four, so that's your radius, okay? So radius, which is r, is equal to four. So we can clearly see that our answer is uh, option number four. All right, let's take a look at problem number four. It says, if distinct planes R and S are both perpendicular to line L, which statement must always be true? So let's say we have two planes. Um, let's sketch the, uh, sketch the planes. So let's see, this is our first, first plane right here. Two distinct planes. I'm gonna copy that. All right, so let's say those are our two planes, and this is plane R right here, this plane R, and then this is plane S. So what do we know? We know that the planes are made up of an infinite collection of lines. So let's just draw some lines on plane R. So for plane R, um, let me use red lines to draw here. So for plane R, let's just draw some lines. All these lines are, are on plane R. Okay, so we have a line there, have a line there. And then let's put another line right here. Okay, and then plane S has a whole bunch of lines too. Okay, so let's draw some lines on plane S. A line here, a line there. And then another line, let's put it right here. Okay, all right, so it says, um, they are both perpendicular to line L. So we have these two lines are both perpendicular to another line L right there. So let's say we have this line that these two planes are perpendicular to. Now, what do you think is going to be the case with um, any line on these two planes? Okay, so this is perpendicular right here. This is 90 degrees. Let's look at this line, for example. 
this line is perpendicular to this plane, so this line on plane R must be perpendicular to that line too because this line is on this plane. Now how about this line right here on plane S? Since this line is perpendicular to this plane, that means that um, this line is also going to be perpendicular to this line, line L. Okay, let's label line L right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and extract just one case and then we can extrapolate from that. This is line L and this is a line on plane R Let's use the color. On plane R, we have line. Uh, we have just one line for R, <clears throat> and then we have another line on plane S. This is for S, okay? Just one line. We can extrapolate from there. So now let's look at uh, what we can what we can determine. So since this line is perpendicular to this plane, these two planes, that means this line um, on plane R is going to be perpendicular to this line L, and then this line on plane S is going to be perpendicular to line L also. Now, if you have a line like this, uh, we can call this a transversal, and two other lines, if the interior, I'm sorry, these are corresponding angles, right? If these corresponding angles are congruent, what does that tell you about these two lines? If this um, corresponding angles are congruent, it follows that these two lines are parallel. So this line is parallel to that line. Remember that if you have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, corresponding angles are the same. The reverse is also true. Since you have two corresponding angles um, in, a, in a situation where two lines are cut by a transversal, those two lines must be parallel. Okay? So since every line on R is going to be parallel to every line on S, what does that mean? It simply means that the two planes are parallel, okay? So the conclusion here is that um, plane R is parallel to plane S, okay? Because every line containing these two planes are parallel to each other since they're perpendicular to line L. And then we can clearly see that our answer is option number number one okay and this result is consistent with one of the um, theorems on the regents prep website they have a collection of all the lines and planes theorems there which is an excellent resource so this is the theorem right here it says if two planes are perpendicular to the same line they are parallel okay so that's exactly what we're dealing with here we have two planes this is plane s and plane R, and they were both perpendicular to line L, that follows that the two planes must be parallel. Okay? So um, that's that's the conclusion that we arrived at selecting option number one. Okay, now let's go ahead and take a look at um, the next question, problem number five. So for problem five, it says if triangle ABC and its image, um, A prime, B prime, C prime, triangle A prime, B prime, C prime are graphed on a set of axes. Triangle ABC and uh, its image, um, A prime, B prime, C prime, they are congruent, okay? So if they're both congruent under each transformation, um, except what? Which of these transformations will preserve, will make them congruent, okay? So if you have two triangles that are congruent, then what, what does that mean? So um, if, this is a different color here, <clears throat> if, um, if triangle ABC is congruent to triangle A prime, B prime, C prime, what does that mean? It means that their lengths and angles are the same. Every every single um, uh, piece of this of, of this triangle is congruent to that. Okay, so if these are congruent. That means that this implies that um, the angles, angles, and lengths are the same. Okay, are the same. Do you know another word for a situation where the shape, the, the dimensions of a shape is preserved under transformation? 
this is all this is known as an isometry okay so um if triangle a b c and a prime b prime c prime are congruent that means they um are or the the iso the transformation is an isometry let's write it down the transformation the transformation is an isometry the transformation transformation is an isometry so what what is cool about an isometry an isometry preserves the shape okay it preserves the dimensions of the shape both the angles and the side lengths are exactly the same okay that's what an isometry is but if a transformation does not preserve the dimensions or the shape any either the angles or the side lengths then it's not an isometry okay so let's take a look at all these transformations right here and see which of them changes the shape, the dimensions of the shape, or which of them is not an isometry, okay? So D2 basically means a dilation by a factor of two, dilation by two. What is happening here? It basically means that the side length is going to be extended or increased by a size of two. Now, if you increase the side length of, a, uh, of the tri original triangle by two, is it going to be the same shape? Is the length going to be the same? The answer is no. So this transformation, namely the dilation, is not an isometry because it changes the length. So this one does not preserve the congruency of the two shapes. Okay, remember, if two objects are congruent, the object and the image uh, is an isometry, and dilation does not preserve that. R90, what is this? What kind of um, uh, transformation is this? This is a rotation by 90 degrees. If you rotate an object by 90 degrees, you are not altering the shape. Okay? So this is an isometry. This is good. Preserves the size. R equals y, um, R, so y equals x. This is known as a line reflection. Okay? A line reflection. And a line reflection is an isometry because, because you're just um, uh, reflecting about the point. You're just reorienting the order of the points on the triangle. You're not changing the size. Okay, so reflection is an isometry. Okay, so the shape, the dimensions are preserved here. And then um, number four, T, negative two, three, this right here is a translation. Translation is as though you were sliding uh, the object. You're sliding the triangle two units down. I'm sorry, two units to the left. That negative two is the direction along the x-axis. Two units to the left. And then three units up. Now, if you just slide a triangle to the left and up, does that change the dimensions? The answer is no. So guess what? This is also an isometry because the length and angles are preserved on the transformation. Okay, so the only um, transformation here that does not preserve congruency, which is not an isometry, is option number one, which is a dilation. So any dilation by a factor other than one will result in the alteration of the size. Okay, so we can clearly see that the answer is option number one. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. You can feel free to subscribe to our channel and uh, do post a comment to let us know what we think about, let, let us know what you think about this presentation. More clips can be found on mod.sip.com slash test prep. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.